this is me, Erika Stahl von Holstein. And this is me, Luca de Biaz. Welcome to Reimagine Talks, the podcast that challenges the way we think. Today we're very excited to be here with Mr. Antonio Vittorino to reimagine migration, one of the most polarizing topics of our time. Antonio Vittorino has an outstanding career as a lawyer and policymaker in Portugal, the European Union, and the United Nations system. He's been a judge in the Constitutional Court in Portugal, Minister of the Presidency and National Defense in the government of Antonio Guterres, current UN Secretary General. And he has been European Commissioner for Justice and Home Affairs. Mr. Vittorino was the Director General of the International Organization for Migration until the end of last year, at the time in which global numbers of migrants and refugees soared significantly due to factors like armed conflicts, poverty, and the effect of climate change. Who better to reimagine migration with? Antonio, thank you so much for joining us here today to delve into one of the most polarizing and also most important topics of our time, and one that has been dominating public debate, at least in Europe, for, let's say, at least a decade. So um, having been at the heart of this debate for a very long time, what do you mean when you say migration? And why do you think it's so important to reimagine how we talk and think about this concept? It's a great pleasure to join the Reimagine Europe talks uh, with a subject that uh, definitely is on the front page uh, everywhere in the world, particularly in Europe. You know, migration is one of the oldest realities of humankind. Humans have always migrated, have always been on the move. And we can make some distinctions about migrants and refugees, but at the end of the day, migration means that people is in search whether of a better life in a place different from the place where they were born. People can migrate for study. People can migrate for love including and uh, it's time more and more people migrate because of poverty because of climate change because uh, of bad uh, governance so the reasons are multiple but in fact it means that uh, people is in, in search uh, those who migrate are in search of uh, a better life in a different country from their own this reality has always been with us. You should remember that the United States were uh, populated by Europeans in the 19th and 20th century that migrated from Europe to the US. That's why we say that the US is a, a melting point. But uh, also in Europe, you have uh, lots of examples of people who migrated, particularly after the Second World War. And that was the origin of the International Organization for Migration. So. It's a permanent reality. Today, uh, migration is uh, changing its pattern. The flows are very flexible and the numbers are indeed on the rise. And that's what is at the core of the current debate. And the um, causes of migration like climate change, war are not going away. Uh, and this is a problem for every thing but also for migration how is going to uh, to to change migration in the future with in this scenario i think that there are a few points that that need to be clarified yes indeed the people flee from uh, poverty and those who are po poor migrate but uh, the reality today is that uh, a large number if not the majority of those who move are middle class are not the poor of the poor. Because even to migrate, and here I include uh, regular migration, but also irregular migration, you need to have some money to move, some money to travel. And therefore, the idea that only the poor migrate is uh, a wrong assumption. 
Secondly, uh, it's sometimes it's very difficult to say that there is one single cause for people to migrate. Quite often, there are several relevant causes for migration. For instance, you mentioned climate change. Yes, climate change is becoming each time more and more a driving force for people to move. But for the time being, the vast majority of those who move because of climate change, they don't cross international borders. They just move inside the same country. They are what we call the internally displaced people. But of course, we cannot exclude the possibility that if they don't find solutions for their lives when they move inside the same country, they will start moving across international borders and they can become migrants. Even more, out of the 14 countries that are more impacted by climate change, so where climate change is a driving force for movement, 12 of them also know conflicts. And when you are in front of a person that has moved, it's very difficult to say what was the main cause, if it was climate change or if it was conflict. But the fact that conflict and climate change playing together, they are at the root of the decision, which is always a tough decision for people to, uh, to start a movie. The second point I would like to make is that uh, in our mindset here in Europe, we see migration as a south-north movement. Everybody wants to come here. Well, in fact, the figures show that the continent that has more migrants is Asia. Secondly, that uh, flows from south to south, which means from a country in the global south to another country in the global south, are much more relevant than the flows from south to north. You look to Africa, for instance, and uh, in, in Europe there is a narrative about we are being invaded by Africans. Well, in fact, so only 16% of those Africans that migrate, they move to Europe. Because more than 80% of the migrants from an African country go to another African country. This means that migration is quite often an intra-regional process, more than an international process. And if you compare the figures, in Europe last year, you had 200,000 people arriving in uh, an irregular way. You have, at the southern border of the United States, in Mexico, 2 million people waiting for an opportunity to enter the US. So you need to keep proportion. You need to keep your eyes on realities and on the figures. And you need to fight back the distortion that some narratives bring along about the realities of migration. Uh, this is fascinating. Talking as, a, as a, somebody whose family went from north to south, as a Swede growing up in Italy and now living in Belgium, also regional versus this big international that you're talking, I find it very interesting, uh, all these things that you're mentioning with these uh, you know, wrong assumptions and the fact that we have certain ideas in mind when we talk about migration that might not echo um, the reality out there. Um, in your experience, how harmful is it that we have these unfounded assumptions or assumption based on narratives maybe as opposed to looking really at, at the reality out there in terms of being able to deal effectively with the real concerns and the real challenges that uh, migration poses, as well as the opportunities. Erika, you are quite right. The distortion of the reality uh, creates a problem, an additional problem, that deviates people from what is essential when it comes to migration challenges. And then one thing I always emphasize is that this is a policy area where perceptions and realities are very much far apart. And uh, you cannot ignore realities, but you cannot ignore perceptions. And so you need to address both at the same time, even if sometimes perceptions are so wrongfully made that they drive us apart from reality. But if you expect just to address 
wrong perceptions, that will not change realities. But if you act on the realities, you cannot ignore the social and cultural environment in which migration operates, and you need to address perceptions. So it's a double challenge, perceptions and realities. You are a very good example. Uh, you know that which is the country in Europe who gets more who gets more money from remittances from their migrants abroad. It is France. France is the country that has more income in their in their, to their, their national budget coming from migrants. My own country, Portugal, three percent of our um, budget comes out of uh, migrants remittances. 3% is also the figure of uh, European funds that Portugal benefits from being member of the European community. So there is an economic reality here that cannot be ignored. But the economy, the, econ the economic argument will not do the case because we have to deal simultaneously with the, the economic and social reality of migration, but at the same time with the cultural and identitarian approach to migration. And the economic arguments, no, ma no matter how powerful they are, they will not address the sense of insecurity, the sense of fear, of anxiety that exists in many societies because of migration. And this uh, opens up a new avenue for discussion. Uh, migrants are a very easy scapegoat. Migrants are presented as the source of all evils by populists and by unscrupulous politicians. But in fact, even if we had the most perfect migration policy, we would not solve the social problems that are the causes of empty migrant cities. Therefore, we need to understand that uh, only engaging with those who translate their anxieties, their fears, their sense of insecurity due to the social situation of their country, of their community, of their families, we need to translate those anxieties into a rational debate and explaining that migrants have a positive contribution to the host communities. And I can provide you all the figures that show that in terms of economic growth, in terms of contribution to the tax system, in terms of contribution to social security, migrants are net contributors. But on the same side, on the other side, you have to address the challenges and the difficulties of coping with those who are different. Those who have a different uh, color of their skin, who may have a different religion, who have a different cultural background. And of course, as you know, living together is always a challenge, but it is also a two-way street. It challenges those who arrive, the migrants, that have to adapt to a new cultural and social environment, but it also challenges the host communities that need to incorporate people who are different from the natives, who have different habits, different cultures, and have to build a mutual relation of interaction and mutual confidence. That's the challenge. Yes, yeah, speaking to about cultures, we tend to think about diversity and the idea of uh, migration as a set of numbers uh, regarding migration in general uh, seems to hide the differences between different places from where uh, migrants come and the different places in which people th 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 they go uh, and the different relationship between uh, cultures that this way uh, we create. And we usually are quite curious about diverse cultures. Uh, and this is not the case when it is set in the frame of migration and problems and uh, this kind of uh, stuff. Uh, 
why is it so? Why are we not able to see migrants as a way to travel in different cultures uh, without moving, but waiting for them to come? Well, first of all, we need to understand that diversity brings, uh, enriches the communities, and uh, diversity is a source of uh, initiative. Migrants are usually young people or people at a young age who bring energy, who bring a strong will of winning in the new societies, and uh, they contribute to the uh, renewal of generations of countries of destination that uh, in many cases, like in Europe, are fast aging countries. But definitely this new reality of people coming challenges old habits, old uh, attitudes. Uh, it is very common to speak with people in regions where there are migrants settling and they say, well, the landscape has changed. It's no longer what we, we used to be. And uh, we need to understand that reaction because people need to realize that times are changing, as the, the song says. Times are changing and uh, communities need to adapt to new realities. What is crucial? is that uh, there is social cohesion in those host communities. That social cohesion and social dialogue and uh, is not undermined by uh, migratory flows. It's a very tough question, I do recognize. If you have high levels of concentration of migrants in a certain area, that can be a source of, of, of stress and that can be a source of potential tension and conflict. So, as I always say, integrating migrants in host communities, it's a micro process, which means that it needs to be dealt at local level with special responsibilities for the local authorities, with special responsibilities for integrating in the workplace. The workplaces are extremely important to integrate migrants in the host communities, as well as schools. Having the kids of the migrant families attending the same schools as the kids of the host communities is a very powerful tool of integration. Now, I give you the other side of the coin. It is sometimes difficult to plan the social services available to migrants in a community in advance. You know, know really how many people are coming. I can give you a few examples. Hospitals in the, at the border between uh, Colombia and Venezuela were overwhelmed by the arrivals of Venezuelans. And therefore, the Colombians who used to have an easy access to hospitals found it more difficult to have access to health care. And uh, the hospitals were not planned to receive such a large number of people coming from Venezuela. That requires the mobilization of the social, uh, of the local community, of local authorities, of, of the uh, health care authorities to uh, try to minimize the potential negative impact of arrivals of migrants in those host communities. So it's never granted, it's never guaranteed. You need to constantly make sure that uh, the way the people uh, who come are welcome does not disrupt life of the host communities. Uh, you can do it that through interaction because we are all human beings and we are all entitled to, to the same human rights. And um, if you had a magic wand today, what is the one thing that you would do first in order to try and come with some concrete solutions or suggestions of how to develop um, uh, uh, or reimagine the concept of migration to something that is adapted to the 21st century and to the challenges um, that we will probably be facing in the decades to come? 
Well, if I had a magic wand, I would provide everybody with a strong doses of rationality and common sense. Because we need to have a rational debate. Migration is a challenge for everybody. It's not an easy issue. It's an issue that requires common sense, humanity, and a, a rational debate. A, a, a clear, uh, appeased debate. Uh, it's not easy. It requires uh, goodwill. It requires engagement. But definitely, it's a reality with which we have to live. So if you ask me about the counter-narrative on migration to imagine Europe, I will give you three prerequisites. The first one is never skip an argument against migration. Never don't play it. I know that uh, nowadays uh, negative arguments uh, are much more easy to be believed than positive uh, are. But no matter how evil is the intention of the argument, you cannot leave anti-migration arguments un un unanswered. You need to address them. Second prerequisite, always produce the facts and the evidence. Facts are nowadays rather undervalued, but the realities need to be brought to the forefront of the debate. They need to be shown to the audience. And of course, if those who are in good faith want to look to the realities, they will be provided with the, the facts, with the evidence, with the reality of migration. Last but not least, my third prerequisite, be humble. Be very humble. Because there is no silver bullet. There is no magic solution. You need to focus on the realities on the ground and understand the different arguments that are at play and try to build mutual trust and create the best conditions for mutual understanding. It's a challenge that it is worse. Thank you very much. If I can just ask a last question, because I see that we have a couple of, of, of minutes left and I find this very interesting. You mentioned before that migration is often treated as the scapegoat for other um, elements or problems in society. And we have been talking to one of your, your countrymen a lot, uh, Antonio Damasio, who has been looking a lot at the role of emotions in feeling and in, in thinking. Do you think that the, these very strong reactions toward migration are more a symptom of the fact that there's a lot of fear and anxiety in society today than about the real concerns on migration? Um, and do you think that these are deeply interlinked? So maybe one of the biggest solutions to the problem of migration is dealing with the underlying fears and concerns um, that are currently dominating um, the public discourse on this. Absolutely. I have no doubt that uh, to a large extent, the migrants are a scapegoat for other social problems like, for instance, disindustrialization in a number of areas. In a number of areas, people who lost their jobs or don't see future in their current uh, professional occupation. It's very easy to say that migrants are the ones who are responsible when in fact, it is uh, the delocalization of industries that plays a key role there. Second example, the rising of Ukraine. There is definitely a, a blockade of the progress of the middle classes in the countries of the global north. And that insecurity, insecurity and fear for their future and for the future of their children can be easily uh, brought as a blame to migrants. And inequalities have been on the rise in all global North countries. And last but not, uh, last but not least, you, you see that uh, uh, communities uh, are fearful 
about uh, a globalization that they do not master and that they are afraid that will have in the future worse consequences for their traditional way of life. And uh, people on the book is quite often associated to globalization. If we want to go on living in open societies as we want to live, in open economies, in human societies, we need to understand that migration is part of the solution, is not part of the problem. What a wonderful way to end this discussion, to reimagine migration. We need to see how it's part of the solution and not part of the problem. How the current debate is probably being weaponized a lot to uh, act as a scapegoat for other problems that have very little to do with this. And that actually, if we focused on this in a different way, um, there are very real ways and very real examples of how to approach both migration, but also integration that you mentioned in a way that can uh, work in a, in a very different way and to be positive as opposed to as it is seen today as a negative. So a lot of food for thought there. Let's hope that we can manage to reimagine migration in, uh, in, in the near future, because it's definitely something that we see is very uh, necessary. But I want to give a big thank you, uh, Antonio Vittorino, for joining us here and for sharing all your experience and expertise with us and to give these really important uh, starting points for how we can reimagine migration and why it's such an important topic to um, reevaluate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erika. Thank you, Luca.